Hello, all you brothers and Pegasus, welcome to the NBS show. I am your host, the man, the myth, the hippogriff, Silver Quill, hijacking the spotlight for this discussion. But one man army is not all that entertaining, so I have brought with me my own running crew. First off, we have podcaster extraordinaire, Norman Sanzo. Yo, yo, what's up, y'all? Who is trying to be wiggity whack hip dog? Yeah, I even got my gold chains. Turn on that and gold chains, yeah. That's, I thought you meant Michael in chains. Like, dude! <laughs> oh, that's something else. You're getting your funk on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah! Little John. Yeah. Oh, Titan Dago does that so well. And our resident Pegasus, but maybe suffering from a case of not so many wings, Sapphire Heart Song. So is the Bionic thing going to get old or what? It never get old, y'all. Never, never, ever, 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 ever. This will die down one day, I swear. Probably until someone says, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ugh. Okay, Sulphur, you sound like, um, who was it from Family Guy, uh... <laughs> oh, God, Herbert. Yeah. <laughs> long as I don't sound like that creepy grandpa. <laughs> uh, anyway, so what's the topic of discussion today, my friend? Well, in case you haven't noticed, we're a bunch of characters. Mm, true that. And I think it would be good if we had a talk about what makes good characters. For we are watching a show that has featured many characters, even more uh, secondary characters, in uh, more recent seasons. For which I'm glad. The introduction of the uh, cutie map has really opened the avenue to meet more residents of Equestria. And they are granted a very finite time to make an impression. So... We could just ask what works, what doesn't. We all have our favorite ponies, but of all these secondary ponies we've encountered, what works best for them? Think back to any supporting pony. Doesn't matter what season. So it cannot be Spike or any member of the main six. Hmm. All right. And let's be a little extra, extra exclusive. It can't be any of the princesses. <laughs> all right, then. Oh, this I can do. Mm -hmm. I have many I can name off. I need to open up the wiki just in case. Well, Mostly because I prefer the secondary over the background. Well, then, I think it only first start then with Sapphire, and have you list your top three extra characters. All right, top three. I already have them in my head. Uh, number one, Fleur de Lis. Number two, Sapphire Shores, who I was introduced to in my first episode of... Upon viewing a uh, dog and pony show, and Cherry Jubilee. They stand out for me because they are very pretty ponies. Pretty, pretty pony. Excellent. Well, we'll, we'll get into the hows and what for is shortly. But Norman, even if you're checking out the, uh, Wikipedia, yeah. so top three, eh? And this is for characters that speak out to me or stand out to me. Stand out to you. Something about them caught your eye. Alrighty then. So I'm going by order of how I see them on the wiki page. This is not from good to bad or bad to good. So number one stands out to me is Prince Blue Blood. Prince Blue Blood? Yeah. Uh -huh. And Princess Amber. And this is cheating, but he see Turnip Truck. Why is that cheating? Because he didn't really do much on show, but he excels in the comics. Ah, there we go. So those are my top three because of, well, <laughs> um, how I see them on the wiki page. But honestly, if I have to go down, I have more. Gilda, Trixie, uh, Starlight Glimmer, and so on. But yeah, this is what I see first on the wiki page. And for me, all right, of my three, uh, one <sighs> is Coco Pamel. Ah. Second up there, I would put, and I actually have to uh, look up her name a little because... Uh, well, we only just met her, and my memory is not always great with names. But Saffron Masala. Oh, her. <laughs> I love her. Even I remember her name, mostly because Saffron. Well, it's a spice well, and a flower. I've, I'm not well-versed in spices. I'm not much of a cook. But she is, and I found her both delightful and intriguing. And then my numero uno supporting character, Big Macintosh. <laughs> Yay, Big Mac. How could you forget? Well, that's a question for you guys who didn't say Big Macintosh. Why did you not say Big Macintosh? Can you tell I like Big Macintosh, Big Macintosh? <laughs> yes. Uh, I was too busy watching... That's not a word! What? No! 
sorry, sorry. That's not a word. Yeah, it is. Oh, uh, it's a it's a word, and the fact that I phrased it's in the context of Big Macintosh makes me wonder. Ay ay ay! Oh my! But anyway, yes, Norman is like moving on. Get Big Macintosh. I just well, I don't care. <laughs> and then Eliora's head exploded by the thought of that. Okay. Oh, yeah. Eliora's get gunning for you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wait, let's play this up. She might murder you instead of me. Yay! <laughs> well, she won't see me at Nightmare my- Nights, and she's not going to Brownie Con, so... Yeah. Yeah, but it can be like the Red Wedding. <laughs> Eliora says hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, anyway. Anyway, so, as you can see, we have a pretty... Pretty diverse cast of secondary characters. Some of them have only appeared for an episode. Some of them have appeared for a few, and some are almost consistent background characters who don't do a lot. And it changes as it goes. So, let's dissect this just a little bit more. Sapphire. Let's see here. There was Sapphire Shores, Princess Ember. No, that was Norman. Forg- forgive me. Terry the- Jubilee and Fleur de Lis. Now, Fleur de Lis. What is it about Fleur that uh, that draws your eye ever so? Well, it's kind of hard to tell for me, like, with this one. Because, I don't know, she's always been sort of standout ever since I saw her, like, randomly, like, watching My Little Pony one day, like, on the hub, like, before internet gave me, like, a whole list of episodes to go by. I just saw it randomly on TV, and this was one of the episodes that was playing... And she stood out to me design-wise because she didn't really look a lot like other ponies. She didn't have, like, the normal poses that most other uh, mares had during the time. I had not seen Luna's design. I just get this weird fascination over certain, like, like a light, pale color with hair, like, Bright hair. Well, Fleur's hair really isn't that bright, but I don't know. I really like her. I liked her design. It was subtle. I don't know what it is. So there's a visual appeal. Yes. I mean, that's the long and the short of it. For me, that's the same with, like, Sapphire Shores and uh, Cherry Jubilee. I like their design. Is there a an action or... uh, Something they did that sparked your mind into dreaming up personalities or scenarios for them. With Fleur, I imagined, like, this ideal of classy, yet promiscuous, to say the least. (laughs) It goes into the oh my territory where my mind goes. Then again, I've always been that way. That's my main reason, as not so... Practical and analytical as it is. But for Cherry Jubilee and uh, Sapphire Shores, it goes into, like, deeper, more connected feels. Like, with Sapphire Shores, she was one of the first ponies I was introduced to that wasn't the main six. Actually, Rarity was the first pony I was introduced to. With Sapphire Shores... She was one of the main reasons where it's like, okay, this show is not what I thought it was going to be. That and, well, Sapphire. It's kind of my thing. It's going to be sensational. (laughs) Yes. Ow! (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Okay, for a minute I thought you were in pain. (laughs) It's like, I I know my pop isn't all that good, but (laughs) really? Really? All right. No. No, I'll, I'll me, shut up now. <laughs> oh, what? You're doing fine. And I'm thinking of... It's like, I'll shut up now. <laughs> I'm thinking of the fact that she was literally hanging off uh fancy pants. And I found it uh fascinating. It's like, is this our first equestrian gold digger? <laughs> no. Yeah, that was another thing I thought of when I first saw her. It's like... I want to call her a gold digger, but I like her design way too much. So, but then we sort of, well, we we hit this question. A lot of people were presenting, I've seen fanfics and the like, where they're married with kids. 
I've seen some where fancy has gotten older and she's sort of moving on to younger, for lack of a better term, targets. <laughs> oh no. Oh my. I think what all these fascinating ways a character could be, uh, interpreted just by a few minutes appearance and I believe only one line. How exquisite. A pony with refined tastes. Oh my. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> I wanted her voice to be a little girly, a little. Well, she may get a she may get a voice change. Yeah. She'll get the bonbon treatment. Probably because she's not set in stone yet. No, she's got to meet a cockatrice for that. <laughs> Although I've noticed in season five and season six, she's been appearing more often, which has fulfilled my need of flair de lis. <laughs> the need for speed. Actually, my brother ran a. Uh, equestrian, like, horse 4-H thing, and the tagline was Need for Speed. <laughs> so funny you mentioned that. It's fu- funny that uh, someone needs some speed out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, really. Oh, my God. Norman, you better not cut this out when you're, you know. <laughs> we'll see. Because it's too perfect. <laughs> okay. All right. So, So, what I get from that is that Sometimes just the character's design draws the eyes, and they can become a favorite, not for necessarily for what they've done, but for what they inspire. We become curious. So Actually, let's... now that I think about it, a lot of my favorite ponies are in that same, like, light skin but bright hair. That's... Oh, God, that's how I came up with my design. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh... <laughs> We will have the bright-eyed, blue, blue-eyed ponies. Oh, God, that... no. Stop. I'm green-eyed. We will have the green-eyed ponies that were adaptive. <laughs> we will be very, very adaptive with our ponies. Oh. We are the, the master fan base. Oh, God. I am being incredibly insensitive with this joke, but I apologize for nothing. Carry <laughs> <laughs> uh, on. Carry on, my favorite son. Because next we are going to talk about Norman's favorite characters and why they caught his eye. With me and my choices, I just picked them out of random. Because, well, if we're going to talk about background characters or tertiary characters that don't show up more, we have a lot. Like, you just pick one. We got the Flim Flam Brothers. We got Wind Rider. We got Suri Polomare. We got the Diamond Dogs, Garbo, and so on. I notice you're only listing the villains. Because I own the villain page right now. <laughs> okay, so apparently Norman's choices are usually uh, limited to what's right in front of him. So, as I dangle my keys in front of the microphone... Ooh, keys! It's shiny! His, his favorite character is now my keys. No, but honestly speaking, when it comes to um, not the main six and the princesses, my personal picks would usually go for... Sunset Shimmer and Derpy. But those are kind of the characters that everybody talks about a lot. I'm trying to be something different. (laughs) I think we should ask the question, why do they talk about them a lot? Well, with Sunset, she's kind of the, oh, I'm the bad girl turned good character archetype. And since she's not been overplayed a lot in terms of the show, we get to see her only in the Equestria Girls movie. And with that, we slowly get a relationship of, oh, you want to see more of her, give us more. And as we're bringing the company that they are, says, oh, fans want more sunset? Well, if you want more sunset, then you have to watch Equestria Girls. Do you want it? <laughs> no. Actually, I've, I've got nothing against Equestria Girls. It's harmless, but yeah. Uh, let's, let's be honest. I'd love to see Sunset come back as a pony. Oh, yeah. Actually, an episode where she meets Twilight's uh, newest pupil. What would that be like? <laughs> that would be awesome. But honestly speaking, I don't know if that will ever happen. I wish for it to happen, but I don't know if it will. Today's gathering of the Twilight Sparkle Reformation Club, <laughs> we welcome our newest member, Starlight Glimmer. Hello, Starlight Glimmer. She's a broader friend. Her name is Trixie. <laughs> oh, wow. <well. laughs> it works. Uh, but seriously, Starlight and Derpy. Derpy is one of those characters that how, literally how. The fandom saw, the fandom found a joke, the fandom ran with it. And this is why secondary characters are so fascinating. Mm-hmm. It's interesting to see 
who the fandom chooses to elevate in a sense. Yeah, and who to latch on. And seriously, Derpy is one of those characters where originally she was just an animation error because eyes up and down and that seems to be a real disease. Is it disease or sickness? I'm not sure how to say it. Some people do have their eyes going at opposing angles. Uh, I don't know what the term is, but I think Derpy is... The history of Derpy, including the infamous Derpy Gate, Mm -hmm. shows that it shows several things. One, fans love to take something small in this show and run with it. In a sense, it becomes theirs in as far as they've envisioned a personality, a history. Derpy was exceptionally uh, refined to even have a job as a male mayor. They fans concocted a link for her to have a daughter. Apparently, that child now has at least three different sets of parents. <laughs> yeah. And here's the thing with Derpy. Der- Derpy here is one of those characters where either you like her or you don't. And once you do understand who she is, I was there from the beginning when she rise up to fame. And the people latch on to her being the male mayor and whatnot. And there's a lot of fiction going on with her name. Even the infamous bubble fiction, like, oh, that fiction's not you know, tearjerker at best, so no. And with Derpy and her progressions, people latch on to things that you mentioned. And her being a male mare, she's used as a background character in terms of that one episode. I remember the episode for Feeling Pinky Keen. She accidentally dropped a whole bunch of items on top of Twilight Sparkle, and Hence, there's how she got her male mare status. And people ran with it. And people from the show took it and ran with it too. So that is awesome. And whole derpy get happened because of angry parents. Well, protective parents, I, I feel like some empathy that they felt like this shouldn't be an attack on my child or making fun of something that might be very real to them. Unfortunately, they went about it in a poor way, which robbed empathy. But here's the thing. This is what characters do. Fans love to take a nugget and run with it, and we make a character, and we sort of claim that character. And the funny thing is that fans actually get upset when the show tries to borrow back that character. Here's my principle when it comes to um show doing what they want and us the fans doing what we want. A good example here is Derpy. Um Derpy in terms of name is no the, they can't use it. It's quote unquote offensive to some people. So for a very long time now they didn't name her. They always name her as the Muffin Pony or something. Until recently they officially named her as Muffin. Yep. Yes. Yep. Even on the uh, Funko toy line, they wouldn't, like, name her, like, directly. They just had I heart and then her face. And then muffins. And let's, I found that fun. I mean, in some ways, it's almost a joke at how silly the whole Turkey Gate thing was. Yeah. Honestly, it was a scare there because there's a certain time in season three where we didn't see the derps. We didn't see derp at all until the ending. And, oh my god, that was just amazing, just to see her back with her derp eyes and everybody saying, yes, yes, yes. Well, let's talk about that. All right, how much would the show have changed if Derpy had not been present? None at all. (laughs) And yet, fans are so happy and relieved to see her. Why? Because they've invested time and energy into this character's identity. She is the fandom mascot in some ways. That is also true. I have to agree. Rainbow Dash may be the marketing mascot for Hasbro, but Derpy is the mascot for the Brony fandom. That's how I see it. So, well, I can't really disagree with that. I mean, Derpy has always been there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Heck, when I first like got introduced to like the Brony fandom through like mutual friends, people would rave over Derpy. <laughs> like they'd like show me nothing but Derpy when I first got started. I mean. This was, uh, like, back in 2012. When you were like, young and fresh and innocent, what happened? <laughs> uh, well. I've never been innocent. Oh, okay. I discovered the internet at an early age of 
I think it was 12. I was in my teenage years. You all go, you all, you kids. Oh, you teenage? I only had internet when I was in uh, form one or form two. That would be in grade eight. Oh, for a minute there, I thought you were, are you a Dragon Ball villain? This isn't even my final form. No. Well, when did you become corrupt, Silver, is my question. Did you, <laughs> did you sneak into your father's, um, magazines there, young man? I was corrupt from the get-go. I emerged into this world, and the heavens cried out, What have we done? <laughs> what hath we wrought? Oh, boy. Wrought, I tells you. I grew up on a healthy diet of mystery science theater. <laughs> oh, God, no, no wonder. And shows that were wonderful, awful, bizarre, and each and every one contributes. Like Ninja Scroll? My... Oh, Ninja Scroll. <laughs> the human body does not have that much blood. Or if it does... <laughs> I didn't know it erupted like a geyser. <laughs> uh. But either way, we we digress. Mm -hmm. So, so Derpy shows us how people, just from a design or a quirk, people can sort of adopt a character and make them their own with their own personality and be very defensive about it. In some ways, they don't want the show to take Derpy back, which is a curious, curious uh fear. But here's the thing. When... The show wants to do something with a character. It's their IP. They're allowed to do whatever they want. And a good example of this is the 100th episode, Size of Life. This is an episode dedicated for the fans with what they've done. And I got the chance to talk to Larson about this. And from what he told us that he did a lot of research to write for certain characters. And those research involved him going on to, well... You didn't hear it from me, but quote unquote, the wiki page, this one, the MLP film wiki. Did he mention anything about a hippogriff reviewer? No, he didn't. His loss. <laughs> I know, but I'm not hurt. <laughs> I know. It's not okay. At all. So we so love you. Mm -hmm. You want me dead. No, not really, but. Okay, not really. I love you too much. <laughs> yeah. I want to hug you and stuff. <laughs> Uh, but from what he mentioned, he did a lot of research on certain background characters, background traits that were not available for him by the show Bible at that point. Um, for example, Lyra and Bonbon. Bon. Why are those two together? Because they look good together, because they color match. The fan latched onto them as a couple, and Larson had to do something. <laughs> Although he he was more daring, I would have expected Lyra to be the weird one in that relationship. I know that's the thing. Lyra being the weird one is so obvious. What he did is okay. I'll subvert that expectation, which is really good. I like it. And what else did he do? Uh, I kind of forgot. But the bowling ponies, the um, what do you want to call this? The big Lebowski. Yeah, the big Lebowski. The Lebowski pigs. The did it like they did a full bowling scene, and even with Doctor Who's or oh, Time Turner, they did right, it. Right, Time Turner, wink, wink. Yeah, Time Turner, wink, wink. They did it. The show has their thing. They want to do what they do, and well, sometimes they give us nuggets to latch onto. And Slice of Life is one of those shows where I fully appreciate them doing it. They didn't have to, but they did it. They did it. And recently, with a recent episode, they put in Link from The Legend of Zelda. Da da! I stole all your stuff <laughs> and smashed your jars, but it's okay, cause I'm hero. You can't, you can't sue me now, sue me now. Da da! Yeah. Oh God! Uh, let's keep, let's keep this going. We can have a whole theme song. <laughs> no. Uh, okay, so. So, again, we're talking about designs, but what about, you mentioned Prince Blue Blood. He's more than a design. With Blue Blood here, once again, the show subverts our expectation, being, oh, he's a prince, meaning he has to be all charming and polite, like, oh, very lovable, like everybody wants to love the prince. No, nope, we hate his guts. We really, really do. We want to kill him. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we really, really do. And in the recent Friends Forever comic involving... Blue Blood and Shining Armor, we understand how he works. And I don't want to kill him. I want to be friends with him. <laughs> I just want to be with him because he can get me anything. 
The guy. The guy. Hey, I'm the dude. Yeah. I got what you need, man. I got the good stuff. He's got your fix. Yeah, read that comic and you'll understand why. And he has that charisma and suave that, oh my god, you're... Actually, I've read that comic. I still don't get it. Wait, you, I thought you were earlier complaining that you didn't have time to read it. I read that comic. I meant when, like, the main series. I Norman was trying to switch up the comics on Norman, me. How, Norman, how could you? That's what I was trying to tell you. It's and not that I didn't read it. I just, well, I read so, that one. I just didn't read anything from the main series because Norman didn't assign it to me. And Sapphire, how could you block in your soul with lies? <laughs> uh, I didn't. Uh, uh, you see, you can hear the corruption. You can hear the rage. So some characters we just love to hate, mm-hmm. it sounds like. Yeah, that's true. And... Honestly, I I want to do the Friends Forever 26 review because I want to hear what people think of Blue Blood. Like, for me, I'm ambivalent with the guy now because starting, we saw him as a jerk. Now I see him as just the guy who's very... Help me if you guys know the word. Manipulative. 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 I'm going to put this in. I just said it. Manipulative. Manipulative. Yes. All right. So it's uh, just try, try to go with like man. Man. Ip. Ip. You. You. La. Manipulative. 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 This feels like the sound of music. Yeah, but. The hills are alive with the sound of music. Yeah, but he, he's that. And. I don't know. I mean, it's one of those character traits where you don't see in this show that much. So it's kind of, hmm, okay. I'm interested in you now. Okay, let's again ex- sort of exposit, or at least uh, take away from this. You like Z- this character because he's not the typical pony. Yes, that's true. Dare I say that's part of Trixie's rise to fame. Ah, that is also true. Because she was a character who was not sunshine and rainbow. She didn't want to go to parties with you. She was very egocentric. I know she's well, got... Well, it's not that she didn't want to be at a party. She just wanted to be at the center of it. Yeah, it's not her party. Now that she's had a little bit more screen time now, people want to see more of her. Well, okay, let's be honest. People always wanted to see more of her. She was the pony who kept waiting to return. And she in that... She returns every three seasons. <laughs> it's... And in that absence, we go ever fonder, mostly through fan works. So sometimes it's not even the show that makes it good. It's the characters that we adopt. There's a thought. It's also true because of the fandom and our involvement with certain characters makes us like them more. If you think about it, um, I'm going to throw it out there. A show on the hub called Dan Versus. It was a pretty okay show, nothing memorable. It was fun, but nobody really latched onto it, and it died out. Except in MLP format where we have Dan versus My Little Pony. Yeah, but still. And plus Wufflepuff. Yeah, true, but they didn't have enough to run another season. So that's the thing with Ponies. It's running for six seasons now. It's the longest running Hasbro licensed show. So, that is interesting. Meanwhile, there isn't a single Transformers season, series that has gotten beyond three, if I remember right. I have a strong feeling that Robots in Disguise may get a third season. Really? I heard it was on its way out. Really? Huh. That ending there with the whole thing going wrong with Cybertron? Huh. Well, uh, well, either way. Either way. That's because but, everybody's too busy watching Steven Universe. Which, what season is that on now? Two? Three. Well, Three, it's but it's had over a hundred episodes at this point. So did My Little Pony. So let's not. Yeah, let... but that had to do it within five seasons. No, it, it reached no, no sixty-five. You're right. But either way, so we've got characters that sometimes defy the norm. And then you mentioned Dragon Lord Ember. Yes. What makes her such an intriguing character for you? I don't know. Ember is one of those characters where it's not the norm. Usually, we see ponies or quarterpeds. Now we get to see bipeds. And she's a dragon. And she's a female dragon at that too. And she's not the typical mean dragon that we always see. She's very Sundare. Almost like Trixie. 
in a sense. And Trixie isn't really a Sunday. You tell that to the fans. Yeah, she'll they'll be shipping her with Twilight till Doomsday. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sunday, 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 Sunday. But Princess Ember here is different and she stands out more in the crowd. So that's one of those characteristic traits that people are looking for. So what I'm getting at, for me it's the design, but for Norman it's not typical ponies is what you're saying. Like that, what you like when it comes to your characters. Yeah, for, for me I like out of the norm, like, Gilda is one of my favorite characters too. Princess Ember here is one of them too. And if I have to stretch my likings and whatnot, I would say I like the sirens in their human form. But that's because a lot of fanfics are involved, but nah. <laughs> oh my, what kind of fanfics? Well, they're more villains than like secondary characters, aren't they? Kind of. Well, villains, villains technically fall into the secondary character aspect. After all, they are part of the show, but they are not the focus. They come along to ruin your day. I was having such a good day till you tried to conquer the world. <laughs> Hate you. Oh, yeah. But I think those are my picks, right? Have I missed anything? Blue Blood, mm-hmm. Princess Ember. Yeah, no, I think you're good. But as Sapphire noted, we've got folks who are drawn to the physical design, and then there are folks who are drawn to how these characters differ themselves from the norm, what we expect. I look mm-hmm. for artistic uh, inspiration. I apologize. <laughs> I'm oh, not interesting when it comes to my choices. <laughs> what are you talking about? You're doing fine, and don't apologize for what you like. It's kind of the whole point of this broniness. Dare to be different. Dare to be stupid. Dare to be stupid. Dare to be stupid. <laughs> Thank you, Riddell. Yep. Silver, what about yours? All righty. Well, here I am. Let's see here. I said Coco Pamel, mm-hmm. Big Macintosh. Yep. And- and heavens to Betsy, I'm blanking on my middle choice. I'm having a bit of a, a mind shutdown. Oh, Me yes. Too. Saf- Saffron Marsala. Oh, yeah, the new one. Yes. All right. Although, so... although, wait, before you do that, let me guess. You like Coco Pamel because she has Fleischai's eyes, isn't it? Does she? She does. I, I was not consciously aware of that. Once again, I look into detail, man. That's what I notice. For me, Coco was a fascinating character because she was the first char- first of them to really show what this whole uh key saga was about, connecting with others and helping reform them. And they they framed her very well. Here she was working under this abusive boss. In fact, at BronyCon last year, Coco was sort of a, an example of how abuse can take place in the workplace. And she provided that needed service, but also she was sort of this young, innocent, innocent soul who was, who was receiving poor instruction from a very cynical person. So there's a certain innocence about her. Now you fast forward a little that you get into made in Manhattan where suddenly this is how a enjoyment of a character can change as much as I like her. I thought, you really need to to step up, Coco. You're being too much of a of a frail little thing. You know, just constantly bemoaning how nothing's going right, hoping Applejack and Rarity will save save her. So it's kind of funny when you witness an underdog, you empathize with them, but as they let the the trouble continue, they you start to lose some of that empathy. Random uh, thing that I've always noticed within the uh, voice acting work. I've always seen Coco Pamel and, like, uh, you know, sorry, Polo Mare as the extremely abusive version of Spike and Rarity. Because they're both played by the same voice actors. Rarity played, well, you know, Tabitha St. Germain played Rarity and sorry, Polo Mare and... Kathy Westluck played Spike and Coco Pamel. It's a random thought that came to mind, but it's always been on my mind ever since I saw that episode. Just, <laughs> I've always seen them in the extremes, you know. No, you see them as polar opposites. They are different sides of the same coin, bound together by fate and Oy. 
fantasize. It was a random shit. thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, don't be sorry. You started it and don't be like sorry. I interrupted, like, just to point that oh, dumb thing out. It's, it's something interesting to point out. Like you mentioned, it's the really extreme opposites of their relationship. Suriporo Mel and Coco Mel here are, one is leading and one is assistant, and the same goes for Rarity and Spike. When I first, like, discovered, like, the analysis community and started watching during season four, I would wait for somebody to point that out, but it never happened. Well, now here it is. Yay! Now it has. Huzzah! But anyway, still look. Continue on. So, okay, so Coco is an example of a character who you, you root for almost instantly. But if something new doesn't happen, that uh, some of that support can fade away, which is unfortunate, but true. Very true. Now, similarly... We come in and we have Saffron Masala, and she is brand new. She's in a d- tough way. I mean, you see her instantly arguing with her father. And, hey, that you know, reminds me with my dad. Uh, hopefully you guys are not arguing over a closing store. No, we're not. Good. Because you see them at their worst, but you also see them come together with love at the end, and that's what makes them sort of fun. That's what makes me want to see them again. These aren't one-note characters. For as short a time as she and her father are on screen, they cover a wide spectrum of emotion, of uh, stress, of trial, trial and failure, and they emerge victorious, and you cheer for them. And I think oftentimes I am drawn to underdog characters. Characters who are the underdog, not necessarily who starred in underdog. <laughs> yeah, but that, that's something good too. Personally for me, I don't see that in the show that much. Only a few characters. For example, like you mentioned, the Masala family. Was it Masala? The naming of families is kind of weird in this show. I mean, we have Mr. and Mrs. Shy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which I thought, wait, he's? Who who adopted the other's name? Or does that even work in this in this culture? That's just not. But yeah, we got Coriander and we got Saffron here. And they started out as underdogs, and, well, in the end, everybody supported them. Yay! Go Ducks! But there's a difference between them as the underdogs and, say, uh, Zephyr Breeze. Paradoxically, we may know more about Zephyr than we do the the Tasty Treat shop owners, but but he is less endearing because of his rampant ego. Yeah, and attitude on, and outlook on stuff. I think characteristic also plays an important part here where characters here, like how they're portrayed or how they're presented to us really influence our decision or really influence our likes and dislikes towards them. With Coriander and Saffron here, they started out as, well, one is being grumpy, one is being positive, And we root for them to succeed. While Zephyr Breeze here didn't really have that bounce where he could interact with someone so we could at least support them every time he did something we hated it how hard is it to clean windows well apparently it's very easy if you get spike to do it yeah which again spike is easier to play than than a kazoo yep while saffron and coriander here they had to go through hell and back to get where they are we'll review that episode when we get to it they had to go through a lot to get to the ending. The more characters display hard work in the show, the more you root for them. Mm-hmm. Coco was working hard. She was doing stuff that amazed Rarity and yet was being berated for it. Mm-hmm. And now, if we're talking hard work, big Macintosh. Five, six seasons we've seen this guy doing his thing, but only recently has he really become a character. I, I think the only time we saw him as a character, was in the comics. When he first appeared, genuinely appeared in Apple Buck season, and he's all like, how do you like them apples? That was his first and for a while last bit of real characterization. A straight talker, very honest with his sister, maybe just a little bit of snark. But every day you'd see him just working quietly, living humbly, and then little by little... When you weren't really paying attention, he'd do something like pull a prank on his sister or promise to, what was it, wear a hula skirt down Main Street. Little things that said, hey, there is a character there. But we started to envision that character because, again, 
absence makes the heart grow fonder. And oh, don't forget, he sings in a barbershop quartet. Yes, bum bum ba ba da ba da da ba 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 da ba. And then, oh, then we had Brotherhood Social. And here's this character who we who we wonder, who we think about, who we we see him, we're intrigued by him, we want to know more about him, and suddenly we do, and people are thrilled to know it. It's kind of the opposite of Derpy, where we didn't want a lot of people didn't want the show stealing her back in a sense. And now we have the opportunity to uh to see Big Macintosh as a full character. Flaws and all. And let's talk about flaws because I think that's what makes these characters so endearing. It's funny that Big Mac, we've often been told his flaws. He's shy. He likes to win. And one of those things that we've seen in Brotherhood Social, one thing is he cares a lot. Like he doesn't want to let people down or let other family members down. In this case, which is Apple Bloom, he will go through dressing up as a girl or, well, pretend to be Orchard Blossom just for Apple Bloom to have a good day at the event. And to be her hero just for a day. Yeah. He cares a lot, but I don't blame the guy. I don't blame him either. It's it, Obviously, he went about it in the wrong way. And even after when he says, I am ashamed, mm -hmm. you feel kind of bad for it. Don't be ashamed, Big Mac. We love you. But In a way, I wish that Big Mac was my big brother because my big brother isn't exactly uh, the nicest guy. <laughs> Well, <laughs> well, well, would you call threatening to pin me up and nail me to a tree upside down unless I clean up your apartment and nice? Yeah. I, I call that Tuesday. <laughs> That's what I do every time. Well, when you're, when you're like eight and, or twelve with an older brother who can, who could do that, yeah. <laughs> I had an older brother. He, we drove each other nuts. Now I have an older, older brother. I thought you were the youngest, Silver. I am the youngest. How many brothers do you have then? <laughs> Just one. He's an older brother. When I was eight, he was older. And now that I'm older, so is he. <laughs> He's very old. Oh, you make us all sound so old. <laughs> uh, but anyway. I'll always be the young one though, even when I'm old. Keep telling yourself that, Grandma. <laughs> You can't call me that yet. I'm younger than you, Grandpa. I can call you whatever as long as it triggers you. Who <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> turned into a papyrus? Again. Uh, carry okay. on. Carry on, my favorite son. There'll be peace when you are done. <laughs> carry on. Oh, God, that was bad. I've heard worse. <laughs> Usually from me. <laughs> so I guess my my favorite characters start off with a note of sympathy. You see them struggling. You see them working hard. You see them wanting to do good. And maybe they're denied. Maybe maybe they're just sort of there consistently. I mean, that's the big thing with well, Big Mac. He's awesome because he's there all the time. He starts to become curious. Seeing the characters repeatedly... uh getting the sense that they're being proactive, you start to wonder, what are they doing right now? What's the next step in their own challenges? Mm -hmm. And with that sympathy come, and empathy comes, basically a sense of curiosity, wanting to know more about these characters later on. And it takes over from there. And that I think that's what draws me to secondary characters. It's funny that, although, Norman, you listed some villains, because you were on the villain page... Mm -hmm. Not many of us really qu seem to question, hey, why is this villain a villain? They're usually pretty cut and dry. Well, there's some villains that I do want to see more of, um, excluding Discord and Green Chrysalis for now. Uh, I do want to know more about the Flim Flam Brothers. I do want to know more about Suri Polymer, Gilda, and Awizoto, Au and Windrider, and even uh, Zap, was it? Lightning, lightning dust. Yeah, even her. I want to know more about them, and even Flash Sentry. Well, let's not go crazy here. <laughs> yeah, but still, I do want to know more of what they've done. And we got that with Gilda. We got that with Trixie, and we saw Suri Polymer in um, that episode, um, the Mod Pie Sister episode. Yeah, that one. So yeah, she was she was there, mm -hmm. but 
Well, we did see her. What was? Reduced to a background pony. Yeah, true, true, but still, sometimes background pony have are plotting. They're plotting. They're plotting. Well, yes, yes. For a time, dear old Starlight Glimmer was a background pony with glasses of evil. Evil glasses. Evil shenanigans. Yeah. And so, therefore, we become curious. But all right, what what turns you off to a character right away? Oy. Zephyr. Characters like Zephyr. Zephyr. What is it about him specifically? Because, as I recall, the goal is to empathize with him, to cheer for his... The thing about Zephyr was his attitude. He's The way he does things. It could be my principle or my outlook on situations where... This is going to be where we're going to talk more about it on the review show with this episode. But for me, I don't like his characteristic because... He gives up. He doesn't want to try. He push all his responsibilities to the others. Dying cloth is simple. You just trench it in dye and it's done. But he couldn't even do it right. That kind of characteristic turns me off to him and makes me want to, nah, I don't like you, bro. Come back with something better and we'll talk. Nah, Actually, bro. Zephyr Breeze scares me more than he makes me hate him. He scares. scares me. Why does he scare you? Well, he scares me because it's scary how that episode played out, and it feels like a gender-bent version of me and my brother. Ah. And knowing how Zephyr Breeze is, he could become me. Like, my older brother... Works with animals and horses and whatnot, and he's a massage therapist. And he's always been a hard worker and whatnot and blah, blah, blah. Kind of like Fluttershy. Meanwhile, there's me, who's the creative spirit, who's lazy and doesn't have a job. And is not really struggling with college, but I could be. If I wasn't on top of my game and had a list of priorities. And, you know, I've got my own style. Our own style. Yeah, Zephyr Freeze scares me because he is, like, the worst type of outcome I could have. Especially since my parents are making me get a job. Well, jobs are good. They offer a new insight on life. I understand. I just don't want one now. <laughs> I know I need to get a job. I don't think anyone really goes off skipping to get a job. We're kind of raised on horror stories of jobs, which is unfortunate. Although the current generation is is, ma is seemingly making more of an effort to blend a job with enjoyment, purpose, and play. I'm a Gen Xer, so I'm a curmudgeon about that whole thing. But, uh, yeah. and for me, a character goes bad when you know what they're supposed to be, and you feel like they're not really going to live up to that. Shining mm. Armor. I, I hate to say it, because I want to like this guy. I really do. There are moments I do like him. But so often he's meant to be like this great big brother, this perfect sibling, this idealized, handsome knight, and you realize he's utterly useless. Uh, for a long time, he wouldn't even greet his sister at the train station. And I just Until think, Until he oh. went insane and sleep deprived. Yes, that was what, actually, funny enough, that episode was like the best presentation for him. And it's a great paradox because he was supposed to be the hapless one, the guy completely out of his league. But in a way, he's the only one who's showing how much he cares. In the past, people, the thing is, Twilight would say, oh, my brother loves me so much, he does such great things for me. What has he done? I mean, this is the guy who wouldn't even come see you on your birthday in Canterlot. But that's the problem with writers when they are forced to introduce a character out of the blue. I mean, there's Maud Pye who was out of the blue, but she did an exceptional job. It's mostly a character who I feel like has potential, but it's going wasted. That's worse than a character who has no potential. Case in point, our high-boned cheek, Zesty Gourmand. Who's that? Oh, yeah, the new guy, yeah, I remember her. The antagonist from yesterday's episode, well, from, uh, from Spice Up Your Life. I knew she, w I wasn't supposed to like her. If anything, I was supposed to consider her the devil incarnate. Mm -hmm. But there isn't anything to her character to make her interesting. 
And so I feel like she's a waste. And you know what? There's nothing on her on the film wiki page. Well, she was such a short-lived character. Uh, that means although, she just came out yesterday, Norman. Uh, there's a film wiki page on Coriander and Saffron. See, that's... Oh, that's, never mind. Well, that's just good and proper. <laughs> yeah. But still. Good and proper. I think Zesty was meant to be bland. And that's ironic considering her name, Zesty, could refer to, like, flavoring. Let me uh, look up the exact term of Zesty. And let me ask you if that sounds like the character that she's named. Appealingly quiptant or lively. No. Does that sound like our character? No, but <laughs> judging by the age of this character, she's gone through a lot and she's gotten jaded. She's got, well, I'm not sure. See, this is what we do when we're curious. We ask, why is this character this way? Suddenly we start to imagine. Some will say she's just a terrible person. Yeah, but honestly for me, when I see Zesty here, and this is going to be in the review show when we talk about it, I see the main antagonist for Ratatouille. Oh, yes. It's it's something similar, but you mentioned to me that they dropped the ball with her because she didn't want to taste the food. Because if it did, it will make her, well, better. Yeah, and that's what Mr. Ego mm. did. He, Anton Ego. Anton Ego. He is. He was a delightful character, a friend to the new. Mm -hmm. Yes, I love Anton Ego. I, what was the line? If I don't chew, I don't let... It was something like that. If it's bad, I won't swallow it. And Zesty reminds me of him, but at least... He got a proper arc. With Zesty here, he didn't. And I don't think the show's going to bring her back for another food episode. Uh, there's a lot of characters I don't expect to see again, and that makes them something of a uninvestment. That was one of them. Until the lost treasure of Chris Griffin. Mm. Oh, yeah. Gilda, Gilda has a lot of going on for her. We at least knew her backstory. With Zesty? Ah. Well, yeah, now we know. And knowing is half the battle. G.I. Joe! With Gilda, we got more because of her relationship with Rainbow Dash. Why, she and Rainbow are friends. Yeah. And, well, and apparently, our... according to uh, Zesty, Rarity and Zesty are friends. <laughs> but it doesn't work that way is the difference. Okay, she also said, Rarity, when, you're, when it comes to fashion, you're average. Yeah, it's insulting in my opinion. Oh, there's no question. She's on the list. Let's sum this up, because we've covered a, a gamut talking about favorite characters and why. And a lot of them comes down to an encouragement for imagination. We've got the main six who are diverse set of characters. They have their own goals, their own views, their own hopes, their arcs. We're curious to see how they express themselves. With secondary characters, I think because of the example the main six set... We're curious about these background characters. We want to know more about them. But at the same time, I think we want the freedom to imagine that ourselves, to adopt them. And that's true. And from my views with the whole fanfic side of it, the writers for the fanfics, they do a lot with the characters. They take those characters and they rule with what they have. And seeing that development sometimes... Skew our perception on certain characters, like for example, it's Derpy. Why is she a millmare? Why is um Dinky her daughter and stuff? Like, why is that? Even though in show it doesn't really show that way, and the whole having a sister for Dinky and so on is like out there. But writers latch onto it and carry on, and it's amazing for writers to latch on to a new episode and try to carry on a story about it. Yeah, and we latch on for a variety of reasons. Sapphire is drawn to exceptional designs. Norman, I believe you said you were attracted to characters that broke the mold or went against the equestrian norm, mm -hmm, so true. to speak. And you're interested in the underdog. Exactly, the people who struggle. Mm -hmm. who, is that who why you subscribed to me in the first <laughs> place? Because I was a struggling newbie or something? I withhold comment. 
you were trying to use me to fulfill your sick fantasy. <laughs> oh, know. God, no. <laughs> that went south pretty fast. Yep. Oh, boy. Look, uh, look, it can't be my fantasy. There was no mayonnaise involved. Oh, God. <laughs> <coughs> but anyway, Silva. Oh, no, Norman, we're going to ride this until you uh, are scared into a coma. Never. Oh, the tragedy. We regret to inform you that Norman Sanzo has become a drooling madman. If you hold a can well, of mayonnaise in front of him. Hey. To be yeah, honest. never mind. I'll tell you later, Silver. <laughs> Carry on. Oh, I don't know. This sounds delicious. This is so delicious. Oh, my. Well, I was going to go back into, like, a fanfic territory. Like, even this could apply to people, too. Basically, <laughs> at one point, I got into, like, a uh, fanfic sudden, like, wanting to write fanfic phase. And before I actually got to know Silver and whatnot, I imagined him, like, if he were to talk to me, as the person who would be easily annoyed by my presence. <laughs> nope. Oh, no, I, I'm the one who... I thought like every time I was around, he'd need a beer. Oh, no, if, if anything, I'm the one who easily annoys. <laughs> I was clearly <laughs> wrong on that. <laughs> I still thought the story I wrote was pretty funny. Oh, well. There you go. I'll have but to show it, you later if you're ever interested. Well, all things are good time, but for now, I think we're, we've yeah. demanded people's time just talking about characters we like, why we like them, and where that really leads us. Yeah, and on note for the audience who are listening to this, if you have your opinions, please do share them in the comments below because I know I'll read it and... Well, who knows? Maybe Sefi would read it, and hopefully Silver will read it too. There you yeah, go. Yeah, I know Silver never does. Oh, I, I read many a comment. Not in the NBA show. Well, he reads but doesn't com- uh, doesn't reply. I don't reply because the one, I don't have the energy <laughs> to do that, and two, basically, I I feel like I I this the comments are people's chance to voice their opinions. I don't want yeah. to start arguments. So. Say what you want. Know that it will be seen. Know that we do read and appreciate all your feedback. Mm-hmm. And I and I would very much like to know people's uh, thoughts on their favorite characters and why is this your favorite character? Doesn't have to be a main character. Doesn't even have to be a speaking role. Mm-hmm. Something inspired you to take an interest in this character. Yeah, like me and uh, Turnip Hayseed. <laughs> I didn't talk about him, but eh, my reason is because of the comics. The comics, which I I felt bad for that poor guy. <laughs> yeah, I. For for a little while there, I shook my fist at Spike. Yeah. <laughs> you destroyed what could have been beautiful. Oh, yes. Yeah. Curse you, Spike. Oh. oh, hey, I found the thing. <laughs> All right. The fanfic? Yes. It's called it's a... You Drive Me to Drink, a Silver Quill fan fiction. <laughs> there, there is a certain fear element to this. I wrote a fanfic about you. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to shut up now. It features copious <laughs> amounts of blood. Oh. <laughs> uh, wrap it up, wrap it up. Anywho, okay. but the question now is we look to the future. Mm. Norman, what is in our future? For next week's review, we are going to review A Heart's Warming Tale, Season 6, Episode 8, overall episode number 125. And this is written by Mike Vogel. His first written work for the show. And Mike Vogel, he was the VP for Hasbro's development. Uh, He kind of quit that job and became became a writer. So, hey, that's cool. Yep. Pursuing his love. Yeah. But so, this episode is all about the Christmas. And, uh, (laughs) wow. Let's just say this one is an interesting tale. Yeah, just think we're 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 gonna be celebrating Christmas in July. Yeehaw! Or will it be in July? No, it'll be just before July. Christmas in late June. Yay! Yay! The coal will serve no purpose. <laughs> uh, oh boy! Unless we have that? a st- steam locomotive. But I think for now we shall call this to a close and thank everyone for their feedback. So for the NBS show, I am Zesilva Quill. And I'm in your Norman Sanzo. Flashy, flashy, flashy. And I'm Sapphire Heart Song. And we're saying adios. See ya. Bye bye. 
Mm, so that's fanfic. Mm. Mm. Actually, here's the ending one because I don't feel like posting the whole thing. <laughs> uh, well, dear Silver, I figured I leave you some extra cash so you could forget pretty much everything from last night, or for it there's <laughs> some future involving my shenanigans that drive you to potentially. Okay, this is too long. Right?